Hi, I'm Frank Tybush. I'm a filmmaker and I'm interested in history. Work brought me to Fells Point, a historic district in Baltimore, Maryland. It's one of the oldest communities in the country and all around you see history being preserved and history dying. That got me thinking, how do people save History at Risk? Hi, and welcome to the next episode of History at Risk. In Maryland right now, they're celebrating the bicentennial of the War of 1812. And I don't know that much about it, so I really want to know what's up with the War of 1812, and in particular, Fell's point in the War of 1812. The best place to start when looking for information about a historic district is the Visitor Center, and that's where I'm going right now. So I talked to some people at the Visitor Center about Fell's Point's role in the War of 1812, and they pointed me to this guy right here, Commodore Joshua Barney. Not only was he a one-time resident of Fell's Point, but he was issued the first letter of mark in the War of 1812. That means he was the first privateer of the war. And on that voyage, he sailed on a ship that was built right here in Fells Point by a shipbuilder named Thomas Kemp. Now, I think I know a place where I can find out more about Joshua Barney in the War of 1812. Let's go. In trying to learn more about Joshua Barney in the War of 1812, I've come to the Battle of Bladensburg Visitor Center, a place where they're really trying to keep his memory alive. Let's go find out more. Hi. Hi, Frank. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for talking to us today. Um, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and what this place is? Okay. I'm Richard Brown. I'm a, a part-time employee here at the Maryland National Capital Parks. Um, this facility here is called the Bladensburg Waterfront Park, and we're part of the Star Spangled Banner Trail that National Parks uh, is, supports. And uh, this goes all the way uh, to Baltimore, uh, up uh, and across into the Eastern Shore. It's primarily a Maryland trail, okay? okay. And what we have here um, in this uh, visitor center is uh, we try to sort of cover the the War of 1812, okay, in terms of what happened, and, and, and in particular, what happened right up the river here. Whether famous or infamous, the Battle of Bladensburg took place within sight of where we are right now. 200 years ago, this was 40 feet deep. Oh, wow. And ships came up here, and this was a major tobacco port and an inspection port for Maryland for tobacco. The British had not gotten over the, the loss of the colonies by any means, and had uh, most British uh, military and naval people uh, had a real antipathy uh, towards um, Americans, okay? They got to Bladensburg around one, oh, maybe around 12 o'clock, one o'clock in the afternoon. Now this is after, in, in August, this is August in, in Maryland. <laughs> and, they, and, and, and George Bleague, one of the characters from the 85th, he's a second lieutenant, talks about the heat in, in Maryland, it was different because he had been fighting in Spain. There was dry heat. Here he comes and gets this heat, and it's it's so damp. And these guys are dressed in their uniform with wool and tight collars, and men are falling out left and right. There's a lot of stragglers. Okay, they get to Bladensburg, and um, there is five thousand militia opposing them. Well, unfortunately, those 5,000 men had been matching, marching back and forth because General Widner, who was a cousin to the governor, um, had been, he was a, he didn't know anything about leading men, okay? It was a political appointment. Right. And so he had heard, oh, they're here, oh, they're there. And so he moves his men. By the time they finally settled in Bladensburg, his men were exhausted, okay? Not only that, when he set up the, def the defensive line, he set it on the other side of the bridge. Okay, so they didn't burn the bridge, <laughs> you know. And and so, I mean, the, the military mistakes are, you know. And also, part of Monroe came to the battleground. He moves the second line of defense, which was 50 yards from the first line. He moves it a half mile back, <laughs> and that's, that's that's the end of the far. battle. Yeah. yeah. And not only that, when the British attacked, when they first attacked over the bridge. The Americans fired on them and, and forced them to retreat. But they also had something that really scared the Americans, and that was the Congreve rocket. Now, Congreve rockets, you couldn't hit the broadside of a barn with a Congreve rocket. I mean, you couldn't aim it anywhere. But what it did was so random that it scared the, the militias who were poorly trained, poorly led, and had really never been in battle before. 
okay? So here come these rockets. They're making this whistling sound, okay? And they're coming down, and you don't know where they're going to land, okay? So they land here, they land there, and they, when they explode, they kill you. Okay, they do kill you. I mean, they're, yeah. they're effective in that respect, okay? And so the Americans, once the British start employing the Congreve rockets, and the British now proceed forward with vehemence, the Americans run. They had just captured the cannons that the British, that the Americans were originally using that did stop them at the bridge. They've captured these cannons, they've turned them around, and now they're firing at the Americans. Now they've got artillery, okay? okay. So they get to the second line, the second line dissolves as well. They proceed up Bladensburg Road. They're coming up the hill, and who's at the top of the hill? This absolutely audacious, bold guy by the name of Joshua Barney, who's around 55 at this point, okay? He was born in 1759, so here's, you know, and so he has brought his, his sailors and marines from Len St. Leonard's Creek. He had a fleet of barges. These barges were between 50 and 75 feet long, and he had been attacking the British just continuously, uh, you know, um, with these barges and carronades. That's all they had was one cannon in the front. He's been fighting this fight with the British. The British know him. They know who he is, okay? And finally, they box him up in St. Leonard's Creek, and he realizes that he is not, he can't get out of this situation because they blocked it. So he burns his ships and then hauls the cannons all the way from down there, all the way up to here, all the way to Bladensburg. Okay. Okay. And he sets himself up at the top of a hill. Okay. Not only did, did he fire the cannons in, but then he charged the British. He only had 500 men. Okay, and each, and they, so they withdrew, but on his flanks, there was militia guarding him. And they withheld for a while, but don't forget, these were trained, experienced troops. They persisted, and that was enough to make them flee. And once they fled, the uh, wagon with his supplies fled with the militia. Oh, man. So there went his ammunition. So he told his men, retreat. Now they didn't run, they retreated. And he, he had been wounded. He had a, 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 a ball in the thigh. So he couldn't move anywhere. And Charles Ball stayed with him, and so did other, another Marine. But everybody else retreated. <clears throat> when the British get to him, okay, they know who he is, okay? And one of the sergeants reports, you know, this is, this is uh, Joshua Barney. And so Ross and Cockburn come over to him, and they parole him on the spot. Why don't we know more about Joshua Barney? And why should we know more about Joshua Barney? Well, he was a hero both of the Revolution and of the War of 1812. Uh, we don't know about him, we don't hear about him the Revolution. He was on the Andrea Doria, which was the first ship to re receive a salute that as a colonial sh uh, ship of, a, of the new nation of uh, America, the United States, received a salute from the Dutch Antilles, okay? And he was aboard that ship as, he was a master mate, I think, on board that ship. Subsequent to that, he was on the Wasp and the Hornet, which were sloops of war, and his, and his uh, actions in the Delaware Bay against the British earned him a rank of lieutenant at the age of 16. Men waited till there were 30 before, back in those wow. days, before they could become lieutenants, wow. okay? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, you can't even imagine somebody 16 nowadays doing, you know, being in, well, in battle at all, but this, he was a lieutenant at 16. Well, Im imagine this. Imagine being 15 year olds. Think of yourself at 15 or whatever, and being on the ocean and being a uh, ship's master, uh, not a master, but being a, a master mate okay. on a ship at 15, so that means you were in charge of all the men, okay? And your captain dies. So all of a sudden, at 15, you are now the captain of a sailing ship. And if you read any accounts of sailing ships, I mean, you, this, was a, this required a great deal of skill. I mean, he's a smart yeah. guy. He understood maritime law, he understood all these things. And now the Americans are at war. By the time he gets back, he gets stopped by a British ship and all the weapons on board ship are taken off off of his his merchantman okay, okay. Uh, and uh, which uh, begins a sort of a lifelong uh, uh, 
anger <laughs> and antipathy towards the British uh, on Barney's part. He was captured three times, okay, and imprisoned by the British. Once he was paroled in Baltimore, he was, he was treated very fairly by the captain. He was actually treated like an officer, as, he, as, as was the, the custom. The other time he was taken with his crew all the way to Portsmouth, England, and placed in prison in Portsmouth, England. Um, that time he was treated very, very poorly. The story is his escape from Portsmouth prison is just a story in itself. And I don't know if we can get into that. But when he, in another situation, at the end of the, this, the revolution, he is in a battle with a ship called the, the, the General Monk, which had been the General Washington, had been taken by the British, renamed the General Monk, and had been blockading the Delaware Bay. Um, Barney is hired by the uh, Pennsylvania legislature, okay, to protect a uh, flotilla of merchantmen and get them out into the Atlantic so that they could then disperse and sell their wares <laughs> wherever they wanted to. And so, I mean, because commerce was, was the lifeblood of, of, of port cities like Philadelphia and Boston and other places. Barney was also very successful in, in his, the, the uh, privateer Rossi. And he was, I believe, the, the, he got the first uh, letter of mark. He may have. I'm not sure of that. Okay. But uh, they were, I mean, he was, he was um, an entrepreneurial character as well as being a patriot. He was really a very, very unusual character. Okay. But uh, he came, he earned about a million and a half dollars for his uh, wow. sponsors. Is yeah. that, and I just want to shared. clarify, is that uh, a million and a half back in 1800s? Yes, back in 1800s. So that's without inflation. That's without inflation. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And that's the ships that he brought in and were sold and the, and the, and the cargoes that were show, sold. Yeah. Okay. Wow. We, we, you talked about the Battle of Williamsburg, but is there more with Barney in the War of 1812? Barney's involvement with the War of 1812 ends with the Battle of Bladensburg. Okay. Okay. Um, he subsequently goes back to Baltimore and then goes to Pittsburgh and his family goes with him and they decide they're going to purchase some land in Kentucky. They get on a, um, and this is about four years later, this, uh, and uh, he's accumulated, uh, at this point I don't know how much he has in terms of funds, but he had accumulated at different times he was he was well to do and then he would lose it okay in commerce generally speaking okay um, and, yeah. well a, a ship would his ship would be uh, uh, attacked by uh, pirates or or a privateer and things like that and so some days his, it was his flag was up and some days it was down you know so um, but he he eventually dies on that trip uh, oh. from a thrombosis from the wound in his thigh yeah that's what what eventually kills him he's a very honorable man if you treat Barney well he will treat you well as well also, okay and, uh, and and at no time am I aware that he did anything um, that was dishonorable you're wearing what looks like period piece clothing yeah, this is if you what, could talk about this yeah this was common these these type of britches with the buttons and the s suspenders were military okay. uh, and also common uh, for every day this was this was not unusual. This is what I'm wearing right now. Now, why are you dressed like this? Well, I'm dressed like this to tell the story of what happens. Tell the story of, of 18, you know, um, late 18th century and early 19th century America, uh, and to uh, tell about the Battle of Bladensburg. Um, you know, the militia at the Battle of Bladensburg were composed of common folk. Who it was obligate, who were obligated to have, to be part of the militia. They weren't. They were poorly trained. They met once a month, and um, the, you know the British could fire three rounds out of this thing in a minute. You know, the Americans are lucky if they get one off in a minute. Okay. And it's kind of interesting that um, you you dress like this. You feel it pulls people in and gets people more interested. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, if you, if you can talk about what it was like and demonstrate different things, what people did, it gets their interest, especially children, because you have to, can't just talk to them. <laughs> You've got to show them something, okay. Now, I find researching history to be really interesting and kind of like going down a rabbit hole. I started this episode off trying to find out Fells Point's role in the War of 1812, and through that, I found Joshua Barney. 
a person I never heard of before and probably would never have heard of if I didn't start looking at this, but really he is the quintessential American hero. Ship battles, land battles, privateering, fighting through being injured, even prison breaks. He's somebody that should be talked about that isn't. And that got me wondering how many other unsung heroes there really are out there. And I'll keep that in mind whenever I research to always look for those people that I don't normally know about. Now, when I was in Bladensburg, I got a lead on an organization that's making a monument to honor Joshua Barney and the Battle of Bladensburg. So next episode, I'm gonna go back there and investigate art's role in historic preservation. See you then.